I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. In your life, you can achieve anything you want to achieve, providing you... Arthur Laundie, welcome to Straight Talk. Thank you very much, Mark. That's a lot of wealth Mm -hmm. and a lot of assets. What drives someone like Arthur Laundie? Mark, the money is not worth anything to me. I very much enjoy my work. I love mixing in hotels. As well as being an investor, I would say, firstly, I am a publican. What is it about the hotel community that it is very attractive to you? It was my upbringing. I was very influenced by my father. He came out of the North and he's 15 years of age, and he was the person who's put the drive into our family. My dad was killed in an aircraft accident. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. And did you have to take over things? Yeah, immediately. We eventually got there, but she was a scratch. I was running the hotel, working five days, five nights, that type of thing, to get us out of it. Did you make a positive decision to accumulate assets? Pretty well right from the start. If something was going to happen and I could avoid it by giving all my money away, I'd give it away. They all mean so much to me, mate. Arthur Laundie, welcome to Straight Talk. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. It's taken me, actually, to get you here it was a bit of a process. Um, I know your grandson, someone came to me through your grandson um, some time ago, um, and then I didn't do it. I said yes. Wh- whoever it was that asked me, it might have even been your grandson, I don't remember, someone reached out to me, and I said yes, and then nothing happened. And then I thought, hang on, um, whatever happened to Arthur Laundy coming on the show? Because there's a whole lot of stuff I want to talk to you about. And it's got nothing to do with the Canterbury Banks and Bulldogs, mate, by the way. Oh, what a shame. And what a shame. You won, <laughs> and, uh, you, and you're going good. Uh, but we will talk about that. Um, but then I thought, no, nah, no, nah, what I'll do is I'll reach out to Craig, and uh, which I did because I, I was hoping I st- Craig's number that I have is still his old number, which so happens to be. And uh, and from there, that's how we organise it. So this is a collaboration. You're sitting there as a collaboration between your one of your sons and I guess one of your grandsons. How many how many grandsons grandkids you got? Thirteen. Thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> four. I've got four breeding children. Four. Bre- <laughs> so you got. You, I know you got two sons. What else? You, you Craig got? Stewart, then uh, Danielle and Justine. Justine. So you got two boys and two girls. I have. And uh, who's the oldest? Craig. 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 So Craig, as we know, or most people would know, was a was a politician. He was a minister of small business, and amongst other things, I think was I think other things came under his portfolio at the time. Um, this is some time some years ago. Uh, Stuart, is he working in your business? Sort of. Sort of. Yeah. And what about the two girls? If you knew Stuart, you'd know exactly. I know what Stuart. I, mean. I just was being polite <laughs> to ask you the question. <laughs> and what about the two girls? The two girls work in the business. They work in the business too. Yes, okay. and their husbands. And their husbands. Mm-hmm. So it's very much a family. Business, so to speak. And four grandchildren. Work in business as well. Yes, I've got, uh, it starts off with Charlie. Charlie's here today. He, uh, he is, and he runs the locker room. And uh, then Sophie is in, um, uh, I think, sales in our head office, Lane Cove. And then uh, I've got Molly working three different hotels at the present time. And then I've got Annalise who helps, she's in the marketing side. I'm sorry, the uh, more the architectural side of things. In terms of designs? Designs is so, the word. Okay, so um, I, I probably shouldn't start here, but I want to start here. How old are you now? 83. 83. Mm-hmm. You look remarkable for 83. Like uh, you're Thank getting you. a, you're getting around no drama. I, was, I, I, tend to, I knew you were around that age, but I tend to look at people, see how they're walking, how they yeah. move, yeah. how they sit. You, you, you're you moving pretty well. I'm going all right. Yeah, so your, your health is good. Yeah, helps. Yeah, it's a, you know I swim each morning and a uh, little bit of gym, not a lot, but swim in the morning and that. So yeah, I'm going right. You're you're in, you're in good shape mentally and physically. Mm-hmm. Um, how does it feel at 83? And I maybe this word's not the right word, but presiding over a, you got a lot of assets, but over a, probably more importantly having a family involved in your business. How does it feel at 83 years of age? Because I'm 68, I keep thinking to myself, well, my, my kids work in various parts of my businesses and I often think to myself, what's it like, what will it be like to be your age and having grandkids, et cetera, working? How does that feel as a, in terms of achievement for yourself? Well, firstly, I love it, the fact that they're there with me. Uh, I'm, I work every day. I play golf on a Wednesday afternoon, but I love it. And I, uh, how does it feel? It, it will very satisf- 
satisfying, very satisfying. I enjoy, I enjoy having my family around me. But is it is it the ultimate goal? I mean, because I mean, you get to a certain level of wealth, you know, and there's all sorts of, you know, musings about what, what people like yourself are worth. And as you and I know well enough that it's usually divide by half, multiply by six. I mean, who knows whether it's right or wrong? It's just some people making a guess. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. It's a lot of wealth mm-hmm. and a lot of assets. What drives someone like Arthur Laundy at a certain age? At a certain age, do you tend to think, you know what, all that other stuff I can add, you know, add another hotel, it becomes marginal addition, and in addition to what I've already got, it's just marginal. I can maybe make another million bucks a year. It's probably additionally marginal. Um, so that's not a driver. How much of this is driving a legacy for the Laundy family and what you hope your grandkids one day will enjoy and their grandkids or their kids? Mark, the money is not worth anything to me. I, I don't worry about money at all. It's nice to be able to say that you have it when you have it. But no, no, uh, I've, I enjoy very, very much achieving um, and I guess – my aim is just to keep going till I can't keep going and I, de- I don't know, you know, I've often said they'll come into my office one day and say, Mr. Laundy, this or Arthur, this, and there'll be no reaction. I said I'll be dead but I would have died in the place that I'd like to be. I, you know, I, I very much enjoy my work. I love mixing in hotels. Customers of mine that were customers of mine 40 years still call in to see me and things like that or ring me. I, I enjoy very much that. I guess I'm just, I'm a publican. Uh, I guess probably an old style publican because I'm, as well as well as being an investor, I would I would pay say firstly I am a publican. And what do you, what what does that mean? You're a publican. Well, I I I do my best to achieve in a hotel by things like I want good service. Still at my age, I want good service. I want good beer lines. I want good beer. I've recently, we built a brewery uh, 45, four years, four and a half years ago. And, you know, it's all about getting my beer out there to our hotels. Your own brand. We've got our own brand. What's that called? It's called Marsden. Marsden. M-A-R-S-D-E-N. Yes. The hotel we built out there was at Marsden Park and the brewery is at at the same hotel. Um, It's been run by a very long time friend of mine from the original Tui's Limited, Darrell McGraw. We're doing beers at the present time for uh, Blocker Roach and for. Um, you mean like as in white label beer? Yeah. So you're you're, beer. Pr- you're producing a beer a for him? A can beer for him, or, or draft beer as well. Going into lots of little football clubs. Uh, I'm involved in it, and Blocker is uh, he's out there getting getting the sales and all the rest of it. Along with Gordon Tallis. We're What's Gordy doing? We're doing one for him up there, what they call the wild. He's uh, a Queenslander. Well, yeah, yeah. Arthur, what yeah, are you doing? Yeah. Well, I, I. He just puts shit on New South Wales all the time. Absolutely. I'm, I'm now, I'm, that's it. Podcast <laughs> over. <laughs> <laughs> now, Gordy, I've known for some time, and he, uh, I think it probably came through Blocker Roach, but. Uh, he uh, he approached and said, "Would you do one for me in Queensland?" So, what, so what, what, what's Gordy's beer called? Has he got a, a name? He's just called the Wild Bull. The Wild Bull. Yes. That's after him. After and what's him. Blocker's one called? Uh, block and Grapple. Block and Grapple. He, uh, he wanted Block and Tackle, but being a, a genetic, genetic word, they wouldn't allow it. Oh, wow. So he's Block and Grapple. Block and yeah. Grapple. I oh, know. I like that. So you are effectively manufacturing for these individuals, but you yeah. are you also part. And of I'm the, part of them. Part of the I'm business part too. Of it too. So you're just mm. basically. Not basically, but you are producing a – you've built a beer business that can produce lots of brands. Yes. And that's the way you get to distribution through yeah, iconic no, people sitting We're there. still very involved, uh, Mark, with both breweries. I've always tried to work with the both breweries and we're still very involved there. They're by far the biggest sellers of our, in, in our hotels and um, – uh, all the people involved in the brewery, I, I get along very well with. I, I work hard with, but being a publican, I think, is trying to satisfy people. But, you know, you can't always win, but I try hard to win. I try to give them good food, good liquor. I mix with them, and so you still get on the floor. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm still. I pick up glasses and uh, wipe tables and things like that, and. Uh, and I asked the staff then not to be embarrassed because I like you – know, this is my life. This is my life. I enjoy it. It's very interesting. You know, it's, it's, 
I just when you were saying about publicans, I was thinking about the life of a publican today. So, like, if I look at someone like John John Hemis, right? Um, he's a different style of publican um, to you. He's mm-hmm. not old school. You're an old school publican. You said more of the old school. And then I thought of, about a pub that used to be just up the road from my school, which was, um, and you're you're from the west suburbs. Yep. It's called Southwest now. I don't think it's called the West <laughs> Suburbs anymore. It was, South, it was West Suburbs in our day, but it's now called Southwest. I call myself a Westie every day, mate. And, I'm, and, and I used to get called a Westie when I used to go down to Cronulla Beach. I remember they used to, they used to give it to us. Um, but I went to a school we were talking about earlier, a school called Benilt um, up in Bankstown. I know it. You know it. And um, my mum used to work at a pub at night up the road from the call, the Three Swallows Hotel. Right opposite. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Just near top of, Chap- and Dallas top of Chapel Street. Yep, that's it. Yeah. And uh, and my my sort of memory of old pubs and publicans is a lot different to what it is today of a publican. My memory of them was the pubs were very basic because I used to hear mum talk about what happened in the pub and I can't remember the name of the guy who owned the pub. but would she's, have been probably John Wall. It was something like that. It was like John that type Wall. of short name. I remember yes. it. And yep. I remember mum saying one time that he had to jump over the bar. Mm-hmm. There was a brawl on there and I uh, jumped over the bar and I was only young and uh, as a kid, right, because it sat in my mind for the rest of my life. Um, and how he pulled a, either a baseball bat or a, a, an axe handle or something like that and he had to get, take to the blokes just to stop the blue. And uh, pubs were pretty, not just necessarily violent, but very fundamental, very rudimentary back in those days. That's exactly what a hotel was in those yeah. days. Yeah, yeah, correct. There was there were no security. There was no. nothing like security, and there was no rules. Like, like so, no basically, you drunk, and you just you towel them up and That's throw right. them out. And they, when they come back then the next Friday night, you say, "Listen, you behave yourself, or you can't come back come, come back mm-hmm. in." How much of that still sits in Arthur Laundy's DNA? That process, that that type of real basic fundamentals about pub life. I speak of it often. Um, I my I was I was born in Punchbowl. I lived in a place called Hearn Bay, which is now Riverwood, down the end. Well, of Bel- I was near River. I was at Benner Park. All righty, well, I'm down the Bel- down the end of Belmore Road. I, I I lived after leaving the hospital. Of course, I lived in number fifty four Coleridge Street, Hearn Bay. Yeah, so you were a bit further down. I'm oh, right good. two st- two streets from uh, uh, Riverwood Station, which was Hearn Bay Station. Yeah, okay. So, and, and Belmore Road is where all the factories were because that's where my dad worked. Mm-hmm. And we lived just across, there was a paddock there. But Belmore, but Bennett Over is where I lived. So yes, right, okay. right on the edge. I lived there when it was, a, it used to be a tip originally. And then they filled it in, they turned it into a park. Um, right, yeah. Which is which is was my favourite place. I love going to play footy there. So so you were born and you're, you're a punch ball boy. Um, parents, what were your parents doing? My father was he was an orphan in an orphanage from the time he was two till the time he was fifteen. It was an interesting story because my dad was um, uh, my dad was one of seven children. The mother and father both alive. All of a sudden, wanted out from the marriage. Neither of them wanted the children, but there was one girl, and my grand great my grandmother then would have uh, took took the the daughter back to New Zealand, and uh, all the boys were put into Burnside Homes, which is on Pennant Hills Road, run now by the Uniting Church, and it it was land bequeathed to Sir Robert Burns, who was Burns and Philip yeah, Burns, yeah, and he mm-hmm. later gave it all to King School. Gowan Grey and all that, and that, but part of it was an orphanage called Burnside Homes. And I can remember till the day, pretty well, the day my dad died. Every Christmas he'd give me a call a couple of weeks before Christmas. He said, I want you to keep next Tuesday available, son. And we'd go into a place called Hoffnung's in Clarence Street. And it was a great big building full of toys. You could buy cigarettes everywhere. It was a wholesale place. And my father always drove those big yank tanks, Pontiac Bonnevilles and all that sort of thing. And they had a boot almost as big as my unit. And they, you'd fill, he'd fill that up with uh, toys and all that. We'd take it out there for all the kids at uh, Burnside Homes. And uh, that was his ritual week, two weeks before Christmas. We'd put it in their big uh, hall, hall there and they distributed it to uh, all the young kids uh, who were still at the home then. It's now run by the Uniting Church, still a similar sort of arrangement, but by the Uniting Church. What sort of impact does that have on a 
a young man being told that story by his father, what sort of impact does that have on you in terms of decisions you make in your business life? I was very influenced by my father. So perhaps best answer to that would be the influence that place had on him. He never, ever forgot it, forgot the place. Um, I would like to think I'm an extremely loyal person uh, and he was a loyal person. I learned so much from him and he came He came out of the North and he's 15 years of age. On his wedding certificate, it had occupation. He was a lift driver and he was a lift driver in the flats in Macquarie Street uh, called the Astor Flats. I used to live there. Did you really? Well, yeah, I, dad- I bought uh, uh, Barry Humphrey's place. Okay. And okay. I bought the one above as well and right I joined on. them all up. I, I lived there for years. Yeah, okay. And I sold it more recently beautiful, to uh, – Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, we did yeah. have a lift driver there for We've a period. We've got some connections, a, haven't we? Totally. <laughs> it, it, uh, he, uh, he, he was a lift driver uh, when he married. He married a little girl from, and you'll you'll know this street too, Meredith Street, Bankstown. I do know the street. And and my my mother's father died when she was 10 years of age. So she and uh, her mother went across, they lived in Meredith Street with my grandmother's two brothers. And um, she went to school. Prior to that, I'm sorry, up till the time, till, pretty well up till the time of leaving school, she went to Bethlehem College in Ashfield. Yeah. And, uh, and then they were both played a lot of tennis in a competition in those days, may still be around, called the Sydney and Bankstown competition. And they were both pretty fair tennis players, mum in particular. And uh, they met playing in opposition teams, went out for, they've told me, six years. And were, upon deciding to get married, bought this block of land in, uh, bought two blocks of land in Hearn Bay, right, uh, now Riverwood. And my mum my and my dad built our house. Physically? I, physically, with with mates and all that. He was the most hands-on fellow you've ever seen. He could do anything. And uh, you might recall over the back there on King George's Road at the top of Hurstville, the dippers up yep, and down the yep, dippers. Do, um, yep. The very first dipper you'd come to there in the old – it's all trees now. In the old days, my father, we would go down the dipper there and he would look at all these houses, all the backs of the houses backing onto the the gully there, the parkland. And and he he used to say to me, I've worked in every one of those houses, son, every one of them. Doing what, like renovations? Handyman. Handyman. He was a handyman. He he just – he would come home of an afternoon from – working at the Astor Flats and on his way home, he had an old Willie's Overlander car. He had no back seat or anything like that and he'd be driving along. If there were Venetian blinds on, on the, thrown out on the thing, he'd put them in the back of the car. If there was an old lounge chair, he'd put them in the back of the Step-toe. car. An old step He'd take them home and he'd pull them apart. In those days, there were springs in the lounge chairs and he would work out just exactly how they do it. He'd work out the upholstering. He'd work out, and if ever you've broken a string, a cord on a Venetian blind, bugger of a job yeah. fixing them, you know. But he worked all that out. Then he advertised in the local paper over there at uh, Hurstville, don't throw these things out. I'll make them as new for you, for, you know, 10% of the price, that type of thing. And he, he met these people all along the back of the Georges River Road there. He used to do their electrical work. He was never an electrician. He worked it out. A couple of burns, he said, but he worked it out. <laughs> he used to do painting there. You know, he did fencing and all this sort of thing. He was just – and he was the person who's put the drive into our family. Our family our family are all, you know, they're goers. They're prepared to have a go. And it all started with my dad and I watched that all my life. We, and then eventually he, in uh, 1948, I was seven, we sold our house at Hearn Bay. And that house at Hearn Bay, I still call in and say hello to the people. But there have been about four different lots of families live over the time. And if I'm going over that way, I knock on the door and just say, my mum and dad built this house, you know. Um, I'm very, very proud of it. I'd like to buy it if I could, but they're not interested in selling it. But when I was seven, my father uh, and mother bought the uh, the uh, Sackville Hotel at Roselle. I went to school at St Joseph's, the little school in Victoria Road there, uh, down there, Catholic school there. And 
and I watched them work. In those days, hotels were from 10 o'clock till 6 o'clock at night. And uh, before I went to school, uh, even as a little, I started, I was third grade there. My first school was actually from uh, when we lived in Hearn Bay. I went to St Declan's at uh, Penshurst, right? And uh, But then there, of a morning, there was no refrigeration in hotels. And they'd have to pack like like our current uh, ice chests uh, e- e- that you'll take your beer out to a party with. They had beer lines on the bottom of them, and they had to pack ice and chip all the ice around the the copper lines in that. And before I go to school, my job was to get the ice off the the old uh, doorstep. And because uh, they get ice got delivered, delivered, and you'd take that in and put it in there, and I'd have to chip it and all that sort of thing. And we were there then, we were there, but my father, I remember, borrowed money left, right and centre, but he made a fair bit of money. I'm not sure whether how much tax he paid on all this money when he was picking all these things up and advertising and doing all that, but he made a fair bit. Of, I remember he paid, I think it was about six six thousand pounds which was a lot of money in those days, for the lease of the Sackville Hotel. We had the lease of that, then later the lease of the Wallara Hotel. Uh, by that time, I'd turned uh, uh, I'd turned thirteen because I I then changed schools and went to St Pat's of Strathfield, and I was there till uh, third year, and then went across to St Joseph's at Hunters Hill. But in that time, we'd sold the Wallara Hotel and bought the Lakemba Hotel. And the old Vic Patrick's hotel. Vic Patrick's, he was two after us. Right. But I used to call in and see Vic Patrick. I, I'm, I'm very much one of those people. I like to follow things up and, and I enjoy that side of it, just saying, how are you going and all that type of thing. I then went to St. Joseph's at Hunters Hill and I was there for uh, three years at there and then um, I came out, went to university pretty pretty ordinarily for a couple of, uh, for two years. I enjoyed university, but they didn't enjoy me, so I got kicked out of there, and uh, I went back to work in the hotel trade, which I really for your dad, for dad, yeah. All I really wanted to do, I wanted hotels and that to get into the hotel trade. And uh, why, why, what is it about those days? Back in those days, what is it about the hotel community? In other words, the patrons, the people who deliver the ice, the people who pull the beers, all that, every yep. every part of it. What is it about that that is very attractive to you? Was it that that was very attractive to you? Was it like, what, did you take that as a sense of this is my community, this is my this is my gang, this is my tribe? It was my upbringing. I really enjoyed. I enjoyed one of the reasons they sent me to Borney schools because at the Kemba Hotel they had this little tiny billiard table at the in the back of the bar there. And I'd spend so much time playing billiards with customers and winning a shilling and things like this. And uh, my, mo- my mother and father started to get a bit worried. Where's this bloke going? So they put me in a Bornish That was a punishment those days, by the well, way. Well, it was a punishment. Because I got threatened to get sent to Oak Hill. Um, well, every time I got in trouble at school, I was, you're going to Oak Hill. Um, <laughs> and you know, and I didn't, the last thing I wanted to do was go to boarding school. So I always pull my head in. But uh, what but most people don't realise, but that was the punishment by parents. It was. You, you're going and to boarding school. used that way. Yeah, no, totally. Was, you're going yeah. to boarding school. Yeah. Uh, these yeah. days it's a privilege you, yes. to go to boarding school. Exactly. <laughs> but exactly. Those, it was a punishment. So, but, and, but the, because, you know, my, I don't think, I don't know if it exists today because I don't really go to pubs much anymore. But, Although I do go to one of the pubs that you own, the Watson's Bay Hotel. Oh, uh, do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's nice. I'm Thank around, you. I'm not far from I'm not going to tell <laughs> everyone where I live, but I'm not far from it. Um, but, but it's a different vibe. Although the front bar, the bar at the front, which is it still has a little bit of the sort of it's local vibe. old school, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's a bit, bit like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, pubs, generally speaking, don't have the same vibe that I remember them going back oh, no. a long, long time. Oh, no. Um, everybody knew each other. Mm-hmm. You knew if you went in the pub on a Thursday night who you're going to meet. Exactly. You'd meet someone different on a Friday night. Exactly. You'd meet someone different on the footy nights, which was in those days of weekend nights, um, on the weekend. Uh, you'd be out on the Monday, be no one there, and if you were there, you'd worry because you look, might look like a bit of a desperate. Um, you, poker machines weren't that weren't a thing. No, it was more ninety seven. It came in nineteen ninety seven. Nineteen ninety seven. No, it, was, so, it was beer. It yeah. was straight out beer. And mates. Mates. And you. mates. And then later on, of course, clubs come into existence in nineteen fifty six, the year of the Olympic Games. 
And then, oh, is that when clubs started, 56? Mm, mm, I think it was 56, might have been 55. But, but it was around it was, that period. That period. They, clubs came in and, and uh, of course, they, they, they made a big, uh, a, a big bang in the ho- affected hotels, et cetera. And um, then uh, so 1964, my father bought, no, 1962, my father bought nine acres of ground at Bass Hill and that was our first freehold. He, 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 I've still got the nine acres of ground, still got the hotel. My office is still there. And uh, he built a, a terrific hotel, a lovely hotel called the Twin Willows at Bass Hill. Uh, is that somewhere near the, the driving theatre? Right beside, right, right beside. next door, I which is now home. which is now a shopping centre. Are you serious? Mm. I didn't know that. Great I big used, shopping. I centre. love that driving that driving theatre, drive-in theatre. It's fabulous, wasn't it? I used to love going. Yeah. My, 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 you know, like I used to sit at the back with my sister, and my brother, and yeah. mum and dad sit in the front of the car. Those days, cut seats were bench seats, and um, we used That's to have right. a little speaker on. The, we used to hang on the window. On the window. That's and right. uh, yeah. and uh, there was a there was a place you go and buy food, basically fish and chips or something. And That's hamburgers. right. And, yep. and nothing better. Mum and Dad would put the chips out on the front seat and we'd all get a hot chip and they'd wrap a bit of paper around it and give yep. you a hot chip. Yeah. I was pretty young. <laughs> yeah. But how good was that? I didn't realise that. So you're right, right next, next to the driving theatre. It's now a shopping plaza, a big plaza, Bass Hill Plaza. Yeah. But that was a shopping centre. No, wow. that was, sorry, that was the Bass Hill. Uh, and you, but you still own it? I still own the land next door where uh, the hotel is built. Yeah. I still own that. And... Uh, to the hotel, that, that and the hotel and the hotel. You guys run the hotel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yes. And uh, so I was there I, when, but in sixty two, I turned twenty one, and at the time we were, he, Dad was building the hotel there, uh, and cash was pretty tough. We were struggling. He was struggling a little. He's getting there, but uh, the lease of the Crossroads Hotel at Liverpool came up. So he threw me into the crossroads at Liverpool. He took bought the lease of it, and I, re- I was at the crossroads at Liverpool, Liverpool two days after I turned 21. And it was tough towns in those days. Conscript had come in and yeah. all this sort of thing for uh, – uh, and the, the soldiers were in the – or the would-be soldiers were in Ingleburn Camp yeah. and Holsworthy Camp. Yep. And we were – Close to, close to Ingleburn, but pretty well in the centre. Liverpool was a tough town in those days. It was country in those days. I'm talking 62. But then in 64, he opened the Twin Willows Hotel and I still had that uh, crossroads till 65. 21's uh, pretty young to be running a pub. It was very young. It was young. I, I used to have times when I, I, I thought, my mum and dad hate me. Put me <laughs> out here. This is they were rough. It was yeah, rough. A yeah. lot of lot of blues, a lot of arguments and all that sort of thing. And uh, dad was a tough bloke. I'll, I'll tell you a, a little. Was uh, he similar sort of stature to you? Because no, you're a pretty no, big no, guy. No, no, he was more like about five ten, five eleven. Right. And uh, but he uh, he came out to the hotel one day, and 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 this is how meticulous he was. He he's looking in the uh, the petty cash thing, and he said. What in the hell are you doing with milk? I said, with milk. And he said, Yeah, all this money you're spending on milk. And I said, I said, Oh, that comes from Jeff Kenny. Jeff Kenny had the the spare parts for tractors and everything right opposite. He I said, he drinks scotch and milk. He said, you sure you're not putting or having too many cornflakes? I said, no, 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 he drinks scotch and milk and he, he drinks a whole lot of it. Jeff Kenny was a very large fellow and you supposed, he was about five foot two and you supposed that he could take his belt off and put it at the top of his head and it touch his toes, <laughs> his belt, one of those fellows. And he, and, he, and he did, he drank scotch and milk every day. My father said, you need a cow out here. And the, and the place had 56 acres of ground. It's now the great big Aldi. Everyone's there now. It's a great Peter big Warrens. building. But it was owned. No, Peter Warren's is the other side. Of the the other side. But he was, uh, he, he used to say, uh, uh, what the reason he bought, one of the reasons he bought the hotel, Tooth and Company in, uh, in um, Broadway were talking about decentralising and building a big hotel, a big brewery out there, and he thought that would be a great day to get the pub near it. But never, ever happened. However, the hotel, nothing like it is now. It's a beautiful hotel now. I had little arches out the front and it was a, a tiny, not a big hotel, but um, he uh, he said uh, 
he said, this is ridiculous, this milk, when you wouldn't believe it. About a week later, oh, the babe came into the bar. He said, can I see Arthur Laundie, please? I said, that's me. He said, oh, I've got your cow here. <laughs> I said, you got what? And straight away I knew what the father had done. So I rung the father and said, you send a bloody cow out here. What am I going to do with that? Milk it. He said, milk it. He said, <laughs> and I said, don't you have to do other things to milk? You could do it. He said, no, you don't. So <laughs> there's 50, he's one cow with 56 acres. So you can imagine he, he was presenting plenty of milk. And, but you should have seen me trying to learn. I had the back feet in the buckets and I, that, that, it was a joke. But we eventually got there, but I had a little old bloke around the place because it was very farm area. All our past, Lippington and all that were all great big properties, farms. And he, uh, Anyway, he uh, so that, I, that was the milk that uh, Jeff Kinney had to have then for the rest of his life in uh, with the uh, with his scotches. Can I ask you a question, Arthur? Mm. I remember, and I don't know how I remember this, but I remember when I was a younger man in my earlier professional days, say in my twenties, that one of the big things I don't know if it's an issue now, but one of the big things in those days when there was a lot of cash around for the publican or for the person managing the joint, was getting robbed by his staff. Yes. Like the 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 um, amount of stuff that got stolen or free drinks over the bar or and then they they had all these sophisticated systems, staff. They put maybe one match here. That means that's Correct. one free drink Correct. I gave. That's, Correct. you know, like, and uh, I've got to collect that out of the that's till it. before I close off. Yep. Um, is that, am I right? Absolutely right. It, it was a big deal. You'd come in, you'd find a threepence in the shilling enclosure of the cash register. It had all the little things that would go two shillings, one shilling, sixpence, each threepence, little, little many container. Pennies in yep. each container. And, and, you know, one of my first things I found was the number of threepence in the shilling. Threepence was three pennies. Three pennies. In those days, pre-67, right. yeah. It was. If there were ten three threepence three in there, they know they could take ten, ten shilling notes out. Yeah. This sort of thing, you know, exactly what you were saying with matches. Yeah, because exactly. I, 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 I heard one with matches. Um, mm -hmm. and But then what you used to have to do was stock takes – to, to make sure takes. Um, you used to have to measure your stock takes off against Jack. the takings, the money. and or, and But the people who were, they were experts at this, so the people who would get jobs in pubs and just keep moving around mm -hmm. and they'd educate the other staff too over mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. forget who they can trust and who they can't trust, and uh, they made a business of this. Absolutely. So as a 21-year-old, um, did your dad ever say to you, what was your dad's first name? Arthur. Arthur also. Did Arthur Senior say to Arthur Junior, hey, listen, mate, um, this is how we get knocked off yeah. and keep your eyes open? And were you – because that's one of the reasons you've got to be on the floor. It was probably the first thing. In those days it was a case where we, we, we would work completely off percentages. You couldn't work off dollars. You yep. wouldn't know how many were down or how many were up, but it would be total percentages and uh, on the cost of goods and the sales. Yeah. And, you know, like if it came in a couple of percent down, depending on what you were turning over, that could be a fair bit of money. Yeah. So, yeah, you had to learn that rapidly, Mark, rapidly. Yeah, because yeah. th that's sort of like, I mean, I don't want to, a bit of a it's sort of an old school, oh, it's a bit <laughs> overused, but this, being educated in the school of hard knocks. Correct. Is, I mean, you're out of Liverpool, which I remember growing up, I'm 20 years younger, or a little less than 20 years younger than you, but like I, I do remember that Liverpool was a tough area. In fact, Basel was sort of pretty tough, but Liverpool was even tougher. So not only are you sort of getting exposed to probably those sorts of patrons, but what you're getting exposed to in those days is no sophisticated electronics like we have today. None at all. And it's all about your eye mm -hmm. what, and about your instinct. Yep. And you've got to have a really strong instinct mm -hmm. in those days. Do you think that skill is lost today? Not for you, but just well, generally. Well, it's probably not as essential today to have that skill that you're speaking of because the whole thing is computerised. Yeah. We, you know, if a person serves a beer now, they can still serve a beer and give it away and not bring it up. Well, then we know nothing about that. That doesn't go through the computer. But the whole thing now is computerised. Cash registers uh, are married to computers 
and it, and it it certainly makes it a lot simpler now to work out whether we've got a problem, how big the problem is if we do have the problem. There's a lot. It's it's also um, slightly different when it comes to tax time too, because everything's measured. Everything's Everything reco- measured. Everything's yes. recorded. Yeah, so it should be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, good, re- good response. Good response. Especially when we have got your son sitting over there, ex politician. Act- that's correct. That's correct. <laughs> um, uh, but not yeah, not, not that I'd ever ever, ever condone anything like no. that. Um, by the way. <laughs> Me neither. Um, so so m- moving forward, when was your first pub that you bought? That was after my dad died. My my dad was killed in an aircraft accident. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. He, he, we all flew. We we had an aeroplane, and he bought it. It was a Cessna one hundred and eighty two. It was it, Bass Hills, very close to Bankstown Airport, yep. and it was based down there. My sister flew it. I flew it. But why did your dad want to have a plane? Just loved aeroplanes. Right. Had, had once with a with a mate of his built an aeroplane, flew the aeroplane. That's scary. It was scary when I heard, but it was before my time, so I did, you know. But he flew the aeroplane, called it Bonnie after my mum, and and landed it and everything else. Got it, there. and then they they tried to get it registered, and the bloke came down and put the undercarriage straight through the plane. You know, <laughs> this thing. So it, it sounded fairly flimsy, but he did. He, he I've still got old photographs of him building this plane and the fi- finished product. And he, uh, but he just loved flying. He loved it, and uh, joined the air force during the war. Never saw any action at all. Got rheumatic fever, and uh, spent most of his time in a hospital in Wagga. Then transferred to Melbourne. My mother went to Melbourne, left me with my grandmother, and this type of thing. So he just loved aeroplanes. But he'd been out to. Uh, he had a lease of a hotel at Wellington, out near Dubbo. And he'd been out there this particular day, took three ladies from Bass Hill who had been working with us, took three of them out there for a joyride. He had to go out and do a few things at his hotel out there. On the way back, went down to show them the dam. This is in 1969. Went down to show them the dam and it would appear got uh, it was a very still day, got uh, confused with his uh, heights and went straight in the water. Wow. Four of them dead. And uh, he was thrown from the plane straight away, and so was uh, uh, and the, the, one of the ladies. And then the other two were not found for thirteen years. They you know, not, they couldn't find the plane. It was such a big dam, a couple of times to- couple of times larger than Sydney Harbour. And uh, so uh, I was overseas at the time, so I had to get home straight away. That was in nineteen sixty nine. Yeah. So and did that, you have to take over things? Yeah, from that immediately. Point? I had to. I had a little hotel. That by that time, my second hotel was the Royal Exhibition in Surrey Hills, down the corner of Chalmers and Devonshire Street, and uh, so I was in there. But then the Twimlows was going very, very well by that time, so. I had to come home and we ran the both hotels for a while. My sister was in, the, put the one in town for a little while and we were, I was trying to run the both hotels but eventually in 71 I sold the Royal Exhibition because we had in those days death duties. Yep, I remember. You remember those? Death duties. And it, was, it cost me 170 in 69 so it was $170,000 in state Death duties and one hundred and seventy thousand in federal death Which duties. Means if you don't have the cash, you have to sell something. It, and that was exactly how. So I, I got out of the Royal Exhibition at Surrey Hills, and uh, we 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 eventually got there. But gee, it was a scratch. It was I was running the hotel at Bass Hill, working five days, five nights, that type of thing to get us out of it because it was tough. I mean, the pub was only five years old. It was built in nineteen sixty four. So, you know. Having having spent the money, amount of money he did, because he had the land to buy first, and having spent that, it was a fair dig. Uh, we we still owed the bank a lot of money and all this sort of thing. So, but that's how it happened. That's that's that was the start of it. But the Twin Willows, we have a lot of hotels now. But the Twin Willows was our stepping stone. It was the diving board from there on in. Uh, where we we just went. Ahead and ahead, even though Dad was only there five years, he was a very good publican, and I tried to model my life on uh, on on his, just as I know my my boys have, uh, well, particularly you know Craig has has tried to do something because I've taught him the way I was taught, and uh, 
So that's that. From there on in, we just started buying hotels and buying. Uh, I was buying leasehold hotels early, but and then capital gains. There were no capital gains taxes. Coming to nine eighty five. Yep, can no capital First gains July. taxes. Yes, so we, you know, you'd get in work a hotel as well as Bass Hill, which was always the base. First one I bought was the uh, the Melton at Auburn, and got in there, paid one hundred and ten thousand for it uh, uh, for a three year lease. Sold it one year later for two hundred and twelve. So I made a hundred thousand dollars in that. A lot of money then. I made thirty five thousand in profit. Paid thirty percent, thirty five percent tax on the thirty thousand, and capital gain on the, the that was free on the hundred. So it didn't take you long to realise this is the way to jump. But that stopped, as you say, in uh, what was eighty five? Eighty five, first of July, nineteen eighty five. That um, stopped. I, yeah. I remember it well because I had a tax bill on first uh, of July, nineteen eighty six. Something <laughs> I made a profit on, and, I'm, and I didn't have, like you. I didn't have the money, and I had to sell something uh, to pay for it. Um, and I will never ever forget it. Um, if I could just go back a step sure. a little bit here, um, your decision to buy real estate, the hotel real estate, as opposed to just the hotel. Sure. Um, is was that ever influenced by? more an accumulation phase in your life as opposed to, say, just buying the lease. So did you sort of at some stage in your business career think, you know what, I'm, I'm operating with an assumption here that you could afford it, but um, I'm not just going to buy leaseholds and run the pub and make the cash flow out of it, three-year lease, five-year lease, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I'm actually going to go and buy the real estate and start to land bank. Did you, Because, you know, like a lot of – wealthy people in Australia, they a lot of made the money out of real estate because like I can, I can think of the car business. So they have a, a car franchise, you know, they're the franchise for whatever it is, but they end up buying the real estate on a corner in Parramatta or something like that. Sure. And the money they make, they make good money on the way through and out of the car business, but they make their real money out of the real estate. Property. Yeah, r- property play. At any stage in your publican career, let's call it, did you make a positive decision to accumulate assets? Pretty well right from the start. Pretty well from the start. Those days, 97% of the hotels were owned by either Tooth and Company or Tui's. Right. right, which meant you had to use their beer. You had to use their beer. Right. Right. And, you could, and if you were in one of their hotels up until about 81 or 2, you could only serve their beer, Okay. We were fortunate at Bass Hill. My father had bought the license of a little old hotel, I forgot, I can't think of the name now, in Sussex Street, and it was a free house, which meant What's that? he had a license, but he could sell it any beer he liked. It right. was not most licenses were owned by the breweries, either Tooth's or Tooth's, and you had to sell theirs. So out there we had Tooth's beer, Tooth's beer, like it is today. But back in those days, it was not the case. So they were tied. They were tied. Tied is the exact word. They were tied to the brewery, either twoies or tooths. A little bit like petrol stations today. Like exactly the same setup. And and, and liquor stores. Yes. Yeah. Not so much liquor stores. Liquor stores stores are pretty well free. They can, they can sell in. They can, yeah. You're right, yeah. but they are yeah. owned by the Woolies and the Coles. Oh, yes, oh, yeah. In that, terms of ownership. Yeah. But yeah. they don't lease them out. No, you're right, you're right, you're right. the breweries. Well, uh, given that Toos and Tuis, you know, Tuis in particular is a particularly famous name, more relevant today because people still buy Tuis and we still see mm-hmm. the two old Tuis, um, you know, feel like a Tuis or two uh, campaigns run on television. Mm. Toos. Steve Rickson. Remember that? St- I do the, remember the, Steve yeah, Rickson. Steve Rickson. And, yeah, right. and Toos was a big name, but I – I mean, I remember the Tooth KB. Was it Tooth KB? Got Tooth Cold Gold. Yeah, yeah. Tooth, Tooth and KB. Co- co- Cold Gold. Tooth and Company. That, That's and it was a, gold. a, it was a gold, gold can. can. Mm-hmm. And it was actually like had a little bit of a, a unusual feel to it. That's um, right. It was wrinkles. A, a wrinkles. Yeah, correct. Mm. And uh, and it was sort of like revolutionary when that first it came was. out. Yeah. And uh, whatever happened to the Tooths of the world? I mean, does that still exist? No. No, Tooth and Company. What a great brand it was. was. T- originally taken over, I think the original takeover for Tooth and Company was John Spalvin. Do you yeah. remember that name? I married his uh, one of his family. Did you really? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I think he was- I met her in- through him. I'm he was pre- a client of mine well, yeah. at the time. 
Well, yeah. I'm pretty certain he was from Adelaide. Yeah, he's Adelaide, yeah. Ad- Adelaide uh, Adelaide's based. team ship. I he think was Ad's team, yeah. 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 Well, he. And David Jones. Yeah. And at one stage, Woolworths, and he one stage had 15% of NAB. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. He's the biggest employer in Is Australia. Is he still alive? Stage. Still alive. He doesn't spend much time here. He spends most of his time over over in, um, in, in the US. Mm hmm. Well, I think he was the original buyer of uh, Tooth and Company. I may be wrong, but I think it was him. And uh, but what and happened? Then, did you let it go or something? Like you just I don't it? know. But I I know then um, it was a great brand. It was a great brand. It was by far the biggest brewery by yeah. far. It was but in then, Camperdown or along the Parramatta Road there or somewhere. No, like. no, it's a Broadway. 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 Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. I remember seeing yeah. the. Um, Number 26 Broadway. <laughs> Your memory's good. <laughs> yeah. And then and the, by that time they had bought Resch's Brewery. Oh, my favourite, Resch- the beer we drink around here. Yep. That well, was the campaign. That's right. And Resch's Brewery was on Dowling Street. Yep. Now East Gardens and all that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, but yeah. it was out there. Still the entry is still there. And um, But you can still buy Resch's. You can still buy Resch's. But you can't buy Tooth's. No. I no, haven't seen tooth's it anyway. It's gone right off. No, yeah, there's no two. You're like a, a beer historian, by the yeah. way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm sort of getting off track. I'm here to talk about you. I'm just I'm because I'm so uh, so fascinated by the history of beer, etc. And so I got I, I apologize. I've got to get back to Arthur Laundy. All right. Sorry all about right. that, mate. That's so right. Arthur Laundy, <laughs> Arthur Laundy started building up a, an empire, like you build an empire. Mm-hmm. I wonder about people like you, like yourself, um, and I sort of said this right at the very beginning, why do you do it? Um, continue at 83. I mean, it's not as if you don't have enough assets. It don't, it's not as if you don't have enough pubs to keep you busy. I mean, you can still live the public in life with what you got, even probably half of what you got. You still live the public in life you wanted to. Um, I think of my old mate Tommy Mooney. I know. I remember Tommy and, Mooney. And Tommy, like, he's my age. Mm-hmm. Um, and Tommy, of course, you know, is yeah, not two well. Two Tommy Mooney's. You're talking about the football. Footballer. Yep. Play for Manor, play for Bay. Canterbury. Byron Bay. Yeah, and yep. he owned a number of pubs. Yes. Loved being a publican. Yes. The Bangalore Hotel, you'd see Tommy there. Yep. Or working in the joint. like Good the, publican. Good publican. Very successful. But, of course, he is unwell. Yes. And uh, sold everything. He also had his own beer brand. Yes. That, uh, the Byron Bay beer, there's a beer brand of Byron right. Bay that he had. He sold it. Made a lot of money. A lot of money. Mm. But doesn't really have much... It doesn't. It hasn't helped his life in a, a physical sense. But that and could have happened anywhere. Do you ever think about that though? Do you ever think? Oh, no. Should I just stop and maybe enjoy hang out what with we're going? Yeah, yeah. No, I don't. I don't. So I enjoy what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay. So that's yeah. the point. It's, it's, mm. Is that the reason you keep let's that call it exactly, accumulating? Exactly the reason. You know, I've got mates of mine all retired and all that type of thing, but I, I I enjoy doing what I do. I enjoy watching the success of my grandson, Charlie, who's doing a marvellous job at the Locker Room, which is a hotel we built right next door to the Accor Stadium. Yep. And I enjoy my grandkids coming through. I was talking to, you know, Molly, the, my one of my, my grandchildren works in three different hotels I mentioned earlier. I was speaking to her on the weekend and and she uh, – they're doing a book on me now. They're writing a book and we were talking about this uh, where, because the author happened to be a buddy I, I was with in Rome when my father was killed. We, 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 we played rugby down at Eastern Suburbs together. We're great mates and he's done a few books. I always knew you were a, 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 Ro- a Rooster fan. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. You play the Beasties. <laughs> I was the be- Easty Beasties. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go on. Because <laughs> I want to talk about your right. sponsorship at some stage. But please please continue. They were, and I was speaking to Molly, and, she, and I said to her, now look, if we do go on that Sunday, I'd like all the grandchildren to be there. I want them all to throw in about Pa, what the story is. I can tell them about the basics of my family, of which I'm very proud. We would be nowhere, and I tell the kids all the time, we would not be off the ground or unlikely to be off the ground had it not been for the very hard work my mother and father did. I said, and I always – I get back to rugby league and I say that I, the analogy I would use is my mum and dad were on the inside and they threw me a ball on the wing 
and then I've just kept running. And it's as simple as that. But I couldn't have run unless that ball was thrown to me. And that, and I use that analogy a lot. With but they also family. needed the runner to, to finish off. Yes, and I, I had to run. And and that's that's been our life. But the kids all know that. The grandkids all know that. I, there's, I don't believe there's one of my children or my grandchildren who, in colloquial terms, is up themselves. I do not believe. That's I believe really important. Their, hand, their feet are on the ground. And, you know, I remember when I went to, I went to boarding school at Joey's, I said, Dad, I don't want to be here. I want to be at St. Pat's. They're all, they're toffs. They're all over here. They're tough. I don't want to be with them. Didn't take me long to realise they weren't at all. But he, he'd say, my father used to say, you are no better than, they are no better than you and you are no better than them. He said, we all breathe the same air. It's very Catholic. You are no, yeah, you're no better and you're no worse. I grew up with an mother, Irish mother like that. No, yeah. I'm exactly the same and thing. It, and it was just that sort of thing. So it was, uh, th- that has been the life and I just feel the grandkids uh, and I just, I love, the beauty of it, Mark, is I love my grandkids like nothing on earth. I've got 13 of them. But the wonderful thing is I know they love me the same way. Wow. We are a butte family, a butte family. And that's just, you know, how I want it to be and I'm very, very grateful that it is. Can, can I – because I, I mean, I'm, I'm here trying to work out for my own future <laughs> what drives people. And vitality, which you have a lot of, particularly for an 83-year-old, vitality is a really important thing. And vitality to me is um, – the stuff that gets me up in the morning, and it's like, I can only talk for myself, and I'm going to ask you what it means to you. But, um, but why do I get up in the morning? What are the things I've got for uh, three grandkids? You know, what do I get up for? Um, I get up for because I like to see the look on my face and my staff. I like to, I like, I'm lucky I got the show. I get to meet interesting people like yourself. That keeps me vital, um, like energized. Um, you know, I look at my diary in the morning, I see who I'm going to talk to today and I go, wow, that's cool. I'm getting to see someone I wouldn't ordinarily ever get to meet and talk to them, find out about what keeps them going. Mm-hmm. In terms of what you do and the empire you built, is it's not so much about, is it fair to say it's not so much about the empire, but it's more about the vitality that the people in your life that matter to you most, grandkids and kids, family, um, you get a sense of vitality from them because you're doing all this stuff for them. Is that, is that what drives you? Is that what keeps you energised and not yes. want to go and retire and hang out with your mates down at the local RSL, whatever it is? Yeah. No, it, it, it is. It is very much an energiser. I, I, I love watching the way they're going. I love, they love talking to me and asking me. They love to know about our, our history. At, but, yes, it, 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 it energises me just um, – but nowadays, at, at my stage of life, it's become mechanical. I, I, I just, it, it just keeps going. If something comes up uh, for sale, if I, if I like it, we're looking at another hotel right at the, at the minute, and and uh, and we'll just go through it. We discuss it. The family will discuss. It. I'll put forward to it. But you know, the ultimate decision at this point is still mine. <laughs> However, they they're all everyone's involved. So it, it, when when your kids were growing up, and um, let's say, um, if I could just pick on Craig for a moment, and uh, he decided that he wanted to go into politics, um, what was that like for you as a father? I mean, what what did you say to him? Or what did he say to you? More importantly, I don't know. He he, he came. He came. We spoke about it, and I, and I was disappointed. And I was once mis, misquoted in the. I, I, I said to him, "That's what I'm asking you the question." Yeah, yeah, I said, "Why do? You, why would you? Why would you want to do it, mate? You've got this. You've got where you are. We've got this." And that. But I never stood in his way. I said, "Mate, I will never ever stand in your way. I will encourage you as much as I can." And I remember a news. One of the newspapers calling me one day and just saying to me, uh, what's, what's your attitude to Craig going into politics? And I said, uh, oh, I'm disappointed, actually. I said, I'd rather him stay in our family business. I said, however, if somebody was to say to me in 10 years' time, Craig Laundy, your name's Laundy. Is Craig Laundy your son? Is the Prime Minister, is he your son? I said, I would not be surprised. I would not be surprised. I know what the guy is capable of. 
I'd prefer him to be here. Um, politics has never been something that I would aspire to. I said, however, he wishes to, and I wish him all the best. And and he came back to the family business. Yes, he did. So he came back um, just before. I can't remember now. Just In before. In fashion, I, he doesn't do too much. You know? That's what he told me. <laughs> That's not, he, no, no, pleasing to have him back. He's sitting over there proudly wearing, um, which I don't know. I don't know why I really let him <laughs> in here, but he's wearing a, a bulldog's uh, pullover <laughs> a, or a, a wind cheater with uh, Laundy Hotels written on it. Mm-hmm. Can we just talk about that for a second? Certainly. Um, um, everybody knows what Laundy Hotels are. Well, everyone knows who Laundy is, um, and Laundy Hotels is not really a brand so much because you promote each individual hotel, I guess, within your own advertising marketing environments. Why did Laundy, you, why did the Laundy family decide to sponsor the Bulldogs? That's a very, very interesting question. I have been a Tigers fan all of my life, all of my life, till about four years ago. I think this is our fourth year now. Uh, I think it's the fourth year. Anyway, but when I was a kid in the Sackville Hotel at Roselle in the 40s. Balmain Territory. Balmain. I used to wander along and we – the football team, the, 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 the Tigers team would train two nights a week, and you'd remember these berries, two nights a week at Leichhardt Oval, come back. But by that time, hotels had closed at 6 o'clock. My father used to let them all in out the back. He became very, very close to them. And then it came at the time where, you know, of a Saturday morning – I remember Joe Jorgensen. He was played for Australia, but he 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 was playing for Belmont at the time. They used to all drink at the pub, and uh, he would at the at the Sackville, and he he'd pick me up on a Saturday morning, or Georgie Watt and these guys. They they'd pick me up and and take me to wherever they were playing. It was always home and away games, and main ma- main game was the at the Sydney Cricket Ground. But they would take me wherever they go, Cumberland Oval. It wouldn't matter. They'd sit me in the spot just near where the reserves would be, and this type of thing. And he'd give me a packet of potato chips and a bottle of Coca Cola, and they'd say, "Now don't go away. We'll be here after and straight after into the dressing room." So I was a mad Balmain fan. Very, very keen on Balmain. Craig's been the one member of the family, but we've got a lot of hotels in the Canterbury-Bankstown district. And Bankstown means a lot to us, like it would to you, it, because it's my heritage. Yep. At, he, uh, but they would, um, uh, they had nobody on their football jumper, the, the bottom of the ladder, nobody on their football jumper four years ago, I think it was. And Stuart's idea, Stuart came to us and said, Dad, why wouldn't you put your uh, name on the football jumper? I said, well, for the Bulldogs. And he said, yeah, all the Bulldogs, the the Hughes's. Jeff Robinson's one of my best mates, right? Robbo, I used to love the way Robbo he played. Robbo is one of my best buddies. I was with him yesterday. But, you know, we're, uh, no, Saturday. Uh, but, we're, you know, the, all the guys, Joey Thomas, uh, Gillespie, Samantha Gillespie, all these blokes, my hotel was like their clubhouse. Gus Gould, my hotel was like their clubhouse in the eighties, right? They were all there, and uh, in Can- in the Canterbury area, in the Canterbury area, yeah. they were at the the, the Twimbleows Hotel, right? That's that where I was, and they'd be all up there, and we were very, we were very, they they'd win a competition, and they'd come, they'd sleep on billiard tables and all this all night in my hotel. You know, I'd bring chefs, the cooks in in the morning to cook them breakfast and all that. Then they cut Jeff Robinson hair off there one time. Remember his long hair? Remember yeah. how, how how hard he used to run? Oh, he's hard. He was hard man. His hair would be out flying out here. He, he just would. run straight into like running a brick wall. He would. Like a brick wall. That's Unbelievable. Right. Yeah. So we had all. I've always and every time they'd play Balmain, it would cost it had cost me some like thirty schooners because I'd have to back Balmain. They'd have they'd all back. What do you what do you reckon, Arthur? And I said, we'll beat you this time. And all this. Are we going Bulldogs or Berries now? No, we're talking Berries probably. Berries, yeah. yeah. At that stage, in the seventies, in the yeah, no eighties. Sorry, 80s. so it might have been Bulldogs. Yeah, it was you know Bull, uh, Peter Moore's time, so yeah. it could have been Bulldogs. But they uh, it was it was the football team, and they'd all be there, and and then I uh, with a number of hotels. And Stuart said, "Why wouldn't you get your name put on the thing?" 
So I, I said, uh, no, nah, I don't think so. But John Ballesty is a very close mate of mine, former East Mayor, yep. but a very close friend of mine. And he was on the board of, uh, of Canterbury at the time. Stuart spoke to him. Stuart said, make a number, Dad. What would you give him? And I said, oh, I'll give him 500000 So they, he took it to the board and the board said, no, that's ridiculous, not enough. And I thought, no wonder, no wonder they're on the bottom. Who'd knock 500 grand off? For back when you when you're running last in the competition, you know. Anyway, they rethought it. So for the first couple of years, I got it cheap. I don't get it cheap anymore, right? No, God, well, I know like what that. the general strip costs. Yeah. Are. <laughs> so that's how, of course, you would, and and that's how you know, that's how it went. So I said, all right, and but when when I first said I'd do it, I said, I don't want to be just a name on a jumper. That's not my life. It's not my my yeah. style. I want to be involved. I want to be part of it. And then Stuart became, you know, we, we were struggling the first couple of years and Gus's name was mentioned to come there and then it seemed to die, just seemed to fall over. Stuart just rang me out of the blue one day. He said, Dad, what's happened to uh, Phil Gould? I said, I don't know. What's happened? What do you mean? And he said, well, well we're in negotiations. And I said, well, I said... I'm not sure, but I'll find out. And and there were little discrepancies in what each party were prepared for and all that sort of thing. And he said, if I rang him, would you meet with him? And I said, uh, yeah, sure. He said, have you met him? Do you know him? And I said, look, I knew him in the 80s. Not well. But he was a player. And I, you know, I said, but no. But the answer is probably no. And I said, well, do you know him? And he said, and Stuart's one of these blokes, of course, that knows everyone. And he said, uh, no. He said, but I'll get in touch with him. I said, all right. Didn't think anything more would happen with it. Stuart got in touch with Freddie Fiddler, who asked would he would he have meet with uh, Arthur Laundy to discuss this kind of thing. And he said, yeah, sure. So anyway, Stuart arranged it. We went over to the North Sydney Hotel. We met because he had to go and do a podcast that evening or something like, I think that was what he had on something with Channel 9. Anyway, he uh, we met and we sat and we talked and I, I thought there's life here. There is life here. What, what is your opinion of, um, I don't mean in a character sense, but your opinion of Gus in terms of football smarts? In two years. Club smarts. In, in, in two years we've come from the bottom where we were getting beaten by lots of scores. 40s and 50s and all that. In two years that he's been there, we are now a competitive football team. We're a top eight now. We're a competitive team now. And uh, I don't think we expected to be in the top eight this year and it doesn't disappoint me because we are competitive. Next year we will move. We need some players in, and you and Nick are well aware of that. We, we, we need a couple of players but we are on the way, right? So anyway, I met with him and I, I found out that, that there's – so I, I got in touch with the board and I said, listen, I don't want to stick around here sitting on the bottom of the table. That, that I said, I think we should be putting the guy on and all that. They they discussed it with me and I think I convinced them. So they said, all right. I said, well, I'll leave it in your court now. So I rang Phil Gould and just said, look, it's in your court now. I believe there's life here. There is life. And that's how it started. He includes us in everything. He includes Craig, includes me. Like if he's interviewing a – when we brought this young fellow, Carl Upalu, down from uh, the Broncos, he rang me and he said, look, I'd like you to be there. So we went out and we had an early dinner one night out there at um, um, Bright Me Sands. And at Peter's. At the, at the Greek place. At the air. One, oh, of, no, one no, of those no, places no, there. Yeah, no, we sat there and we just had an early dinner and and he, he likes me to talk to the young fellows. I see myself as somewhat of a mentor. I like to be involved with the players. I like to be uh, – and, and and he includes me in that area. We've they had, like it too, Arthur. Hmm? They like it too because they get ex- – these young players yeah. coming from all sorts of places get exposed to people like you. Yeah. Don't undersell it. Because I understand. They have. Mm. They think, mm. wow. Yeah. There's Arthur Laundy. I'm meeting Arthur Laundy, mm-hmm. and uh, for them, that's a big deal. Yeah. 
I see it in our club, like when they yeah, meet sure. Nick, like they yeah. like it's like God, and it's it's important to them. Well, it's a big deal for me too. I very much enjoy them. I, you know, I was in the dressing room last night with. Uh, Young uh, Jacob. This is after the Parramatta game. After a great Paramount win. Game. Unbelievable comeback. <laughs> Thank you. I know it was. It was just <laughs> unbelievable. It was great. It was great. And, uh, I, you know, I, I just sit and I talk to them. But I, I want to know what they're doing. I want to know what are they doing with their money. I, and I spoke. I speak to them and say, by the time your contract's finished here, I want you to have something in bricks and mortar, just something. I said, I don't care if it's a villa. But something that will make money for you that you, if you work it properly, you won't be taxed on, you know, and this sort of thing. You know? And and I get very, very involved in that side of things with them. So I enjoy it so much that I've now become a bulldog. Paul Langmack was with me yesterday saying, ask Arthur what his favourite team is. Ask, and I said, mate, I'm a bulldog. He said, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> but this is how, you know, I, I I enjoy it so much. But I think folks like Gus Gould, uh, Gus Gould, we had, uh, we were very involved, particularly Craig, very involved in getting Soraldo to the Unbelievable. Top. He's he's doing so yeah, well. Very involved with getting Cameron down there. Great defensive coach, which people undersell, which is one of Canterbury's strengths at the moment. Like the Quite way they right defended up. when they, uh, one, of, one of your blokes got Simbin for 10 minutes against Parramatta. The way Canterbury defended was amazing. Like, and they started attacking as well. But like, that's amazing. You won the game during that period when you were down one man for ten minutes. I couldn't believe it. I know. And uh, and, and behind a, on the uh, on the scoreboard, correct. Yet, yet they couldn't score again. Yeah, they were leading eighteen ten, but they couldn't score again during that time. I agree with you. They're great. I mean, he's a, he's been a great addition. But by the taking a bit of time to get into to get him into a bit of a rhythm, you know, some sort of cadence in terms of how he's coaching. I guess he's got to find all these new players. He's got to try and put them all together as well. Yeah. Try and work out who's who's who in the zoo. Well. But but it seems to me just from watching you then, Arthur, that this is another source of vitality for you. It is. I enjoyed it. Th- this looks like it's a Big, big deal. It, like mm. you were beaming with enthusiasm <laughs> then, mm. and uh, and sort of like a sense of fulfilment. How important is it for you, in terms of that audience at least, the football players and the Canterbury, you know, the Canterbury players? How important is it for you to be able to pay forward, give back what you have been able to experience? In other words, things like you should get a property. You should get a bit of real estate behind your name. But like, in other words, you're paying forward your advice, your life experiences to these young guys who, by the way, ordinarily would never get an opportunity to have someone like you to talk to them. Mm-hmm. They just play footy, they spend all the money on whatever they spend it on. At the end of their career, they're 32, 33, no one wants to re-sign them. They might get a job in England or something like that, mm-hmm. but they've got nothing. Yeah. How, how important is it for you to be able to pay back? That's why I'm there, mate. Yep. That's why I'm there. I think it's very important. But is that, be- is that is that because, Arthur, you've done so well and your kids are going to do well and your grandkids, do you have it in your heart, this feeling that there's some poor bastards just never get a fucking kick in life and so they just and oh. I'm a dude who can help them do it? Mark, I'm a publican. I've seen those poor bastards that's never got a kick in their life. I see them and, you know, all of these I'll do as much as I can for anybody any of the guys here who would like to talk to me at any time, I, I get a great thrill out of it. I had a, a young fellow, uh, Mick, came up to me at this at this meeting the other day. At uh, uh, that was a, it was former players on Saturday yep. at Canterbury, and they rang me and said, "Would you come over?" Because I know most of them, and uh, he came up and he said, "Mate." You talk to us. You did. You back in nineteen ninety one, I think it was ninety ninety one or ninety one ninety two. We we won the we Canterbury, and on the in the middle of being a Balmain fan at this stage, won the President's Cup this particular yep. year. And I remember Jeff Robinson was coaching them. Peter Mortimer rang me up and he said, "Mate, because for Jeff Robinson, would you give us six thousand and sponsor?" the Prisoner's Cup. I said, yes. Right. And Jeff would bring them all back to the hotel and they all became like sons to me. And there were people like Jason Smith, Robbie Ralph, all these all these guys that went on to play good, big football. 
He said, after six rounds, and I hope this doesn't bore this part of it, but he said, after six rounds, Jeff, K, uh, Jeff uh, Robbo, I was there this Thursday night, and he said, mate, can I have a talk to you? And I said, yeah, mate. He said, we have got a good football team, but I don't, I'm doing something wrong. I don't know what it is. He said, we haven't won a game. And on next Friday night, we play Parramatta, who are undefeated. He said, and we got talking. And I said, would you let me talk to the team? He said, would I ever? I'd love you to. But we are really close, Jeff and I. And he said, I'd love you to, mate. This is in, in 91 or 92. So I went to the, out to Parramatta Stadium with Noel Cumberland over there and, uh, and, and he, he said, I just want you guys now to sit and I want you to listen to Arthur. I knew them all very well. And I just spoke to them about life. I said, I'm not here to talk about football. I said, you guys have forgotten more about football than I ever learned. I said, I'm not here to talk about that. I said, but in, in your life, you can achieve anything you want to achieve, providing you want to achieve. Not, oh, I think I want to do that. It's not like that. I said, there's a little thing in your mind called id, I-D. It's in your mind. If it can convince you to do something, you can do it. But it's got to convince you and you've got to be aware of it's there. You can go out and you, I said, you've seen your case, Jeff Robinson. Run through brick walls. I said, he wasn't thinking of anything else other than running through the Parramatta lineup that time, you know, and this sort of thing. I said, but it, you must be convinced in your own, in your heart. You can't do anything unless, and the th only thing that convince you that is your mind, id. It will control everything, providing you're prepared to follow it. And I said, you've got a bloody good football team here. You've got a damn good coach. A bloke would run through the walls and do everything, you know, everything a footballer, more than a footballer would be expected to do. I said, you've got, it's there. We know it's there. He knows it's there and he's a better judge of football than I am, but he knows it's there. I said, convince yourselves, fellas. You can beat this Parramatta side, but you've got to be prepared. And they, anyway, they went out, they beat Parramatta. They won the next 16 games in a row. Wow. Got beaten by Parramatta in the semi final, beat them in, came back to play them again in the grand final and won the grand final. And this Mick Appleby reminded me of this at the football thing on the set. He said, the On the word, weekend, oh, last on, weekend. On last weekend. He said, The words you spoke to our team that day, I still think of them regularly. He's now got a successful. Uh, trucking company and this sort of thing. He said, but I think of it so often. And I said, mate, you've no idea how much that thrills me that you, I have had something that I've been able to give you that's been worth keeping. Sometimes those things, well, you can't put a dollar figure on it. Um, you know, people talk about people like yourself about they, they just want to throw numbers in front of everything and, you know, put BN after it, which stands for billionaire, okay? And that's sort of, and usually it's the media because that's what they like to deal with. But sometimes, well, I ask you the question, sometimes is it sometimes that the value of that, that one little conversation on the weekend, the value of that sometimes eclipses the value of everything else? I'm not saying you want to give everything else away, but I'm just, it's just that value inside you. Is that a really important thing to Arthur Laundy? Extremely. Extremely. Is that because you I, loved your father so much? I love my father. And, and it's my because mother. that's what he brought to the table? Yeah. He brought this to the table. He brought to the table, Mark, if you want to win, you can win. But don't say you want to win if it's only words. Yeah. Don't say it's you want to win. You've got to want to fucking win. Totally. Yeah. And that, and the, and and I've I've led my life. I've tried to bring my kids up the same way. We've led a life that there been there have been times when I was doing it tough, very early days. Oh God, it was you know, eating the paint off the wall. I've I've helped a couple of publicans, and I've used that description 
uh, a lot of times, paid off the wall. I've helped some publicans. Two publicans were in the hands of receivers, and I went into battle for the against the hands uh, with the with the uh, the lenders. Let me have a go at it. I believe I can get these people out of trouble, and in doing so, I'll get you out of trouble. One was the state bank, right? I remember the old state bank. Remember the state bank Mm -hmm. at Parramatta, and this particular family were in strife. And I said to them, "Would you let me work work the hotel?" I said, "Don't put a receiver on. Receivers they might save an airport, save a milk bar, save the. There's no specialty in receivers." I believe I'm a specialty in my game. I said, let me look after. I believe I can save both of you. And this one bloke said to me, across the table, he said to me, who made you Jesus Christ? I said, no, no, I'm not pretending to be Jesus Christ. I said, what I'm saying is I do believe, but I know I can do it. I believe I can save these people. And in doing so, I believe I can save you. Anyway, they had a chat and they decided to give me three months. I said, I can't do it in three months. I said, these people are in terrible debt. I can't do it in three months. They said, let's give three months a start. And I did it for three months with them. And I went back to this family who were with me at the time. And we went back and went outside and I said to them, I can get you there. But in doing so, you're going to be eating the paint off the wall. There'll be times when you hate me because... It's the only way we're going to be able to do it. Anyway, we went back there and I used to call in that hotel morning and afternoon. It's in the western suburbs, so it wasn't far from me. I'd call in there and we'd say, what about this? And I'd say, hang on, what's this for? Did you need it? What's this for? You know, and this type of thing. And we got them out of trouble and they've now got gaming came in after that and really help them. So they've, they've, now got, they've now got one of the best hotels and they'll be worth – a lot a of lot. millions of dollars, a lot of millions of dollars. and But they're very grateful people too. I remember this particular person, and Craig was part of this, I was sitting in my office this day opening Christmas cards and I'm just talking to Robin, who was a very big part of my life, and, and Craig, talking to the opposite, and I'm opening these Christmas cards and I just opened this Christmas card and I looked at the Christmas card. I said, ah, oh, that's from so-and-so. And Craig said, you dropped something, Dad. And I said, what? Oh, went down. It was a check for $50,000, right? Because they were grateful for what I've just done for them. So I said, okay, look, we finished the meeting. I rang them straight away and I said, I don't want $50,000. I don't need money. I need to know that I've done something for you. That's plenty for me. I don't need the brass. And the person said to me, we've been trying to estimate your time. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, if you don't want the money, I'll give the money to a charity. I don't want the money. So I sent the money straight to Matthew Talbot. I sent it straight out to Matthew Talbot, the 50 grand. Anyway, about six months later, another 50 grand come in. I rang the person again. I said, what are you doing? I don't want it. They said, it's yours. Do what you like. Matthew Talbot, another 50. The third time it came and I rang them, I said, please stop this, please stop it. And they said, um, we, think, we think we've helped you out. We've, we've repaid some of the debt now. Not all of it, but we've repaid it and we will stop now. We know you want to stop. Okay, so another 50 went to the Matthew Talbot. I said, I don't do these things for money. That's not what I want. And there's another family we did the same thing for. And they, these people are now – my greatest friends, they just, they, they, they're, they're so appreciative of what is, I, I just love doing that. Can I, I ask you something, uh, just to finish off, Arthur, so it's interesting, when I was a kid growing up, I used to hear a lot of conversations on Sunday lunches and stuff like that, like, you know, roast lunch and stuff, um, about uh, sayings like, um, he or she die in your arms, he or she was tough as teak, um, and what I didn't realise is that people were talking to, and you've mentioned a few words, you said grateful, you said loyalty, you know, pay forward, um, you know, you're out there helping people who are in lesser circumstances to you, not for anything in return, but out of, and that, that's really the definition of generosity. Um, what I'm hearing from you is what would be considered in 
old school days, we don't talk about this much anymore, but old fashioned virtues, the importance of old fashioned virtues. If you were to sit down and talk to your kids and your grandkids, what are the, maybe if you could just let me know what three, and I'd like to know this from someone like yourself, what are three old fashioned virtues that you think have been, and maybe the things your dad taught you, but guiding lights for your life? What are three really important three old, old school virtues? Yes. We never talk about virtues anymore. No, we don't. We don't hear about it. No. Just as they a guide. Be, they still should be there. Totally. I would say my first would be honesty. Yep. I've always tried to do everything, keep my kids. You know, if they, Craig once came home uh, with a, a little tiny, you've heard these sort of stories before, but we're sitting at dinner and I saw this pencil sharpener or pencil or something that wasn't ours. I said, who's that? And everything went quiet. And I said, Craig, is that yours? And he nodded. I said, where'd you get it from? And after about a couple of minutes, he said, I was down at the little shop in Cave Road and I took it. Dad, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry and all that. And I said, that's all right. We're going back there tomorrow. We went down to the shop and I said, right, go and see the man. He went up and he said, I took this, I stole this yesterday. I'm back here to say how sorry I am, right? And the fella gave him a little bit of chastising while he was winking at me and out we went. He was about six, right, this sort of thing, and he just took it off the shelf. Honesty is, is, is it's just an essential part of life that so many people either take or don't take it for granted. Because we're not born with honesty. You're we're not, taught honesty. You're taught. We see it. That's right. Loyalty plays a great deal of emphasis on loyalty. Loyalty. And I think my third one would be love. Love in what sense? As a, a, a being passionate about something or? No, loving. 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 Loving of life. Yeah. Loving of people. Loving of particularly my family. They they all mean so much to me, mate. And, and it... You know, like if something, if if some, if there, something was going to happen, um, and I could avoid it by giving all my money away, I'd give it away. That'll do me, Arthur Laundy. Thanks very much. Thank you.